Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, thank you all for being connected to this um, fourth meeting of uh, the, the series of lectures uh, entitled uh, La Liberation d'Objet. Um, I am personally, on, on behalf of the school, very happy to welcome today um, Kozo Kadowaki, um, who's an um, architect who studied in Japan, who passed a PhD in 2012, and who has been a researcher for more than 10 years, even 20 years now, because you started your research in 2001 or two, if I'm correct. So research and, and studying architecture has been your whole career, let's say. Um, you also set your office in 2012, a design office, who's mostly involved in domestic, in small scales architecture, with a huge interest on uh, refurbishment and apartment and houses transformation, like you told me. Tell me if I'm correct. Huh? And um, one of the major topic of, of this lecture series, uh, like we discussed this morning together, because it was the interest uh, we have um, between uh, construction, objects, uh, and economy. And um, you said something which is to me very interesting, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll be talking about that today during the, the speech, um, saying that you made this separation, this very important separation between the whole and the elements that constitute this whole. And saying that at some point, uh, an architectural con concept, let's say, uh, an architectural discourse, an architectural position, is, is rather concerned by the whole of the building. And at some point, uh, you also are interested in the way that the object that constitute the building could also find some uh, autonomy and independence from this conceptual statement. And, and, and these this, this questions, this, um, this, this interest, you experimented uh, through this installation for the uh, uh, Japanese pavilion uh, during the previous Biennale in, in Venice, in which you disassembled, transport, moved a whole house, and, and kind of classified all the objects that were um, building this house. So therefore, I'm very, very pleased again to welcome you. And uh, I wish you all a very, a very great lecture. Thank you very much, Kozo. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, hello, good day, everyone. Uh, now, Japan is nine o'clock, so good evening in Japan. So thank you, Chibo, for your uh, kind introduction. I'm very glad that you introduced me very, very carefully. And again, bonjour, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be speaking here at UAV. Can I announce correctly? UAV. Okay, so um, today, um, now my talk today is titled Autonomy of Architectural Elements. So I will share my slides. Can you see my slides? Okay. In just a moment. Okay, um, I know autonomy of elements is a strange term, but I hope the meaning and possibilities will be shared throughout this lecture. And the starting point of my talk is rather the word elements. And you can find the uh, picture with uh, a house with in pictures. And this house is a little unusual for maybe European peoples but also very common one in Japan. So you can see uh, that this house is an, an accumulation of uh, so many, many different elements. You can find um, small eaves or handrails or uh, very uh, strange corrugated uh, steel sheet roofs and many, many things. And each element seems so energetic and vibrant for me. And I think the city itself surrounding 
this house may be said to be an accumulation of various elements. As Thibault introduced me, I am a researcher of a building construction and uh, also an architect. And as an architect, I have learned a lot from such uh, physical elements. So these elements are, in other words, uh, miscellaneous in architecture. Yes, the, this word miscellaneous is another uh, big keyword in today's uh, story. And I see great possibilities in the miscellaneous in architecture. And I hope to share what I see as the possibilities through the presentation of some of my project, including the Japan Pavilion ex ex exhibition at the last Biennale. And first I'd like to uh, present the house in Mezzerola. Uh, this project is 12, 12 years ago, but it is the starting point for today's story. And this is the uh, exterior appearance of the, this is the house, newly built house. And as you can see, uh, this is a model photo. And as you can see clearly in this model, uh, this house is composed of several small boxes on ground, uh, several small boxes. And interlocking, the interlocking with the larger box on the upper floor. <clears throat> and this is another experience. And this is a, a plant, vertical floor plants. And this is a two family house with the ground floor reserved for a couple of parents. And their daughter, uh, who is my friend, and her family live on this, uh, the upper floor. And the upper and lower boxes are interlocked. So the lower floor has the bottom edge of the upper box sticking out uh, like this. And this line, uh, this beam is from the box above. And the upper box creates spaces with different atmosphere uh, here and here and on the lower floor. And going up the stairs to the upper floor. And the box on the upper floor pops out from the boxes on the lower floor. And pop out boxes become uh, bedrooms or corners. And to design this building, the geometric promise of boxes interlocking with each other was most important. So the details of the building are strongly constrained, constrained by the this by this promise or roof. For example, uh, this wall has storage doors lined up, but the presence of the door is muted to make the box appear to be a box. <laughs> and this approach was a characteristic of Japanese architecture of that time, um, 12 years ago. I mean, white in abstract architecture. I think this is an influence from, for example, Kazuyo Sejima or uh, Toyo Ito and So Hijimoto and so. However, uh, it is also true that I felt uncomfortable in such a way. I mean, uh, I feel I felt that doors should be more like doors. And this is what I thought about when I completed this house. Um, to organize the building as a whole, it generally requires compositions or form. In other words, geomet geometric promise or geometric rules. However, the, forms, the form strongly constrains the miscellaneous elements that make up the building. And in addition, the geometric promise cannot be applied to the outside of the building or the outside of the site. So geometric promises divides the world into a conceptual interior 
in an existential, uh, existential exterior. So what is architecture that does not constrain miscellaneous and does not divide the world, uh, interior and exterior? This was my question. So uh, here is a photo we just saw. And this is a house with no architect involved. And in Japan, until recently, common houses were generally built by only artisan, artisans alone, without architects. And these elements of such houses show the many creative ideas from the site of the uh, artisans. So we feel uh, that the elements are alive and vibrant. So my question is, how can we uh, architect design such a building, a uh, very uh, vivable, uh, uh, vibrant, uh, living uh, building? And per perhaps we need to critic the formaliz formalization of architecture by geometric promises or rules. And uh, I have uh, uh, another words. There has been criticism, criticism of architecture uh, formalized by the architect's consciousness. And this is from Dutch architect, uh, maybe you know, John Habraken. And this verse is very interesting for me. And he saw the architects have uh, try to create buildings that will stand the test of time and then compared architects to King Midas, Midas in English, Midas, uh, King Midas of Greece. Uh, King Midas was given the ability to turn everything he touched into gold by God, but he even turned bread into gold. Uh, causing him to hunger. And for Hablaken, gold is a symbol of a immutable value. And Hablaken argued that the architects cannot design the ordinary, which is beautiful because it is so changeable. So I think that miscellaneous in architecture is, in other words, something unchangeable that architects have tried to eliminate the, the, the um, yes, the traditional architect tried to eliminate. <coughs> so um, the next project challenged this issue. Uh, it is my own house, Kadwaki House, uh, completed four years ago in 2018. So this project is in uh, Tokyo. And maybe uh, you know Tokyo is a, a mature city, but it has weak architectural uh, regulations, resulting in a city that is like a set of heterogeneous buildings, uh, many many types of building, uh, detached house or uh, big schools or big supermarkets. Uh, there are many many uh, various uh, different type of architectures. So uh, in designing this house, I considered two models uh, of conceptual architecture. And this model will show the paradox of the continuous and discrete concept. And this area, uh, I mean this area uh, about, uh, by the lines, um, and this square represents an area to be constructed like a site or like a building. And it is surrounded by the heterogeneous object represented by the various, various colored dots. And this is, uh, this is what I named the continuous model in which the elements inside the area, elements inside the area are governed by a certain promise like the house I just showed you, uh, the former project. And I can say that this model is continuous uh, because the elements inside the area are well controlled. On the other hand, the inside is disconnected 
from its surroundings because the inside has its own promise that is very different from the outside. And the next model, I named this uh, one uh, the discrete model. And elements inside uh, the area are designed with reference to the surrounding, surrounding multiple elements. For example, this uh, sky blue dot is referred from the, this outside dot, and this pink, pink dot is from uh, this one. So in this case, uh, the internal elements, internal elements, uh, discrete uh, or different, but their relationship to the sur surroundings is continuous. And Kadwaki House, uh, now uh, I'm now introducing, was designed based on this discrete model. And this is the site. This is the site. And a white road runs along the west side in a, a, a north south direction. And the relatively narrow road also runs along the north side. And this is a diagram uh, showing, condi con showing condition to the, uh, to the west and the north and east, uh, this one, this is east, and the south of the site. It is quite different from the others. And on the west side, uh, shop house uh, line, the wide road, and along the narrow road to the north, uh, detached houses. And the, 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 the east side, this one, and east side is used, this one, as like an alley. And on the south, uh, south side, the neighboring buildings uh, uh, looming. And I designed the, the, the elements in the house uh, of the building with reference to these surroundings. So this house was uh, consequently designed like a collection of elements with different principles of existence. Um, because of this way of design, the house gives a very different impression depending on the direction in which it is viewed. So this is a view from the west and it looks like an abstract three-dimensional object. However, when viewed from a different location, it looks more like a floppy uh, stage setting than a three-dimensional object. And this facade uh, is a reference to the shop house that line uh, the street here. And in Japan, it rains a lot, so the roof uh, sloped. However, a sloped roof, uh, roofed building does not look like a shop. So Japanese put a facade on the front, only that makes it look like a flat roofed uh, building. So, you know, it is the same as uh, what Scott Brown and Venture, about Venture called the decorated shed. And this is the North Facade. The North Facade is a small and segmented, articulated. And this is to match the scale of the detached house along this narrow street. And the wall is uh, titled, and tiled uh, to res resemble the roof uh, of the house. And this is the east side. And on the east side, the next area wall extends out and provides shelter uh, over the alley. And south side, it is kind of a gap between the buildings. And rather than creating a facade, I designed it as it many buildings components were scattering around many, many building component components, not a facade. And and talking about the uh, how is it, uh, small building uh, gap between buildings, 
And when you are in such gap uh, between buildings, you are so close to the buildings that you cannot see the whole building and the components jump out at you, your eyes. So the South Facade uh, seems to have uh, 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 fallen apart, fallen uh, very different components. So let's go inside. A uh, corridor runs through the ground floor and go up the stairs. And the upper floor is uh, the living room, dining, dining room, and the kitchen. So heterogeneous and unique elements. Uh, this one, this one, this one, the coexist, the coexist, coexist here. And in addition, elements of neighboring buildings. Uh, for example, this is a um, unused door of the next, next building. And such uh, elements of the next buildings are also co coexist with uh, elements in the uh, building inside. So it is uh, preci precisely because the interior is discrete and that it is able to be continuous with its surroundings with I didn't design. Uh, this is a, uh, elements, of course, I didn't design, but they are continuous. Uh, they are making a continuous world uh, uh, getting together. But as in need, talking about each element, they are, are very different, so they are discrete. But as a whole, they are continuous um, beyond uh, this building area. Uh, another view. And this is also another view of the uh, uh, second floor. And each unique element has its own principle of existence. I designed uh, each element uh, based on the different uh, principles. So, uh, I mean, uh, there are many, many principles Coexist, co coexist. So such a um, such a space also allows for the work of other designers. For example, this table was designed by an architect friend of mine, and some products are designed by unknown designers or famous designers. For example, this chair is designed by Kazuo Sejima, uh, but I don't know uh, the designer who. Uh, the, the name of designer who designed this part. But this space uh, tolerates this uh, signatures of many designers uh, without coordinations. And going up more stairs, this is a, a three-story <laughs> building. And there are bedrooms on this floor, uh, the top floor. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, there are, uh, of course, uh, many, many different elements. And this is a night view of the south side. And I love this uh, night view because uh, this is like this photo. Uh, this is a photo of a cement factory uh, taken by uh, Mr. and Ms. Uh, Mrs. Behia, uh, maybe you know, uh, photographers. And it looks a little uh, like the certain appearance of my, of my house I, may, I, I already mentioned. And this factory is made up of discrete elements. For example, small eaves. Uh, I think this is a prevent from the as, as concrete uh, from this uh, over, over there. Or uh, small something, uh, eaves, or small uh, elevators or something. Um, however, each element is sometimes the result of creation for a local situation. This is a, a very local situation creation, uh, creation for very local situations. So in other words, uh, this appearance is the result of the accumulation of many arch architecture uh, intellects or intelligence or ideas. So this is a, a result of the very, very uh, accumulation of the very, very small ideas. So um, this is the summary uh, and what I thought uh, when I completed my house. 
Uh, here, I reconstructed the building into a collection of small, unique elements and eliminates uh, the hierarchy among the elements. And as a result, the boundaries of spatial areas, such as the site, became unclear. And also, the work of designers, other than myself, can co 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 coexist. And when I am uh, in this place, uh, it is very interesting for me. I am, the, I am distracted by various elements, one after another. So I am uh, distracted by the buzz of the uh, small elements. So for me, uh, it is a very uh, new uh, discovery for me. Uh, this is very close to the experience uh, of taking a walk in the city, not in the house, in, not like in the, in the city. And as you walk through the city, your attention is drawn to the lovely flowers or uh, to the products on display and so on. So this is a very uh, discovery after it was completed. But anyway, here the building could uh, tolerate heterogeneous elements. So if so, th this design approach would also allow for the participants of more diverse range of creators and makers or producers, uh, productors. So this is the next challenge. So uh, this uh, project annexed of Metal Lab, I worked with my students in my university, but time is run running. Uh, so, I'll, so, so I will uh, talk shortly uh, about this project. Uh, this is a renovation project from a uh, house with karaoke snack into a small office uh, of the factory close to this building. And the design methodology was a continuation of the uh, that used at karaoke house. So in this space, a wide variety of elements uh, and discrete elements co coexist. Uh, another view, another view, and another view. And the uh, the original building had cheap finished, typical of uh, all the common houses. And but this is the new materials uh, we install. We install these times, so totally different materials, yet they co coexist. For example, uh, this is old carpet and old um, wood printed board. And this is a new uh, tiles, but they are a very different uh, made in time and they are, they are very, very different in looking or appearance, but they can coexist co here. Uh, the and I believe that the design me method that allows for the coexistence of disparate elements has the potential to involve a wide variety of creators in this project. In addition, I believe there is a potential to increase diversity of the building production system. Uh, for instance, one idea could be to adopt a uh, traditional construction method in one part of this building, which is not being handled in the market. As a small experiment in this project, some of the, some of the furniture here was designed and self-built by the students themselves. Uh, so I didn't design the, uh, the, the table, uh, students uh, designed for a uh, table for this project. So as a result, this space has become an accumulation of elements designed by multiple uh, actors, including me. And this is a picture took by Shinken Chuksha, uh, who, is, uh, who is the big magazine uh, editors. And, but this air conditioners unit, this air conditioning unit was installed installing by the clients after the construction so I don't know this uh, air conditioners, 
but this architecture has the ability to accept such things without feeling any sense of uh, discomfort. So uh, this is the first, first part, and the first part, part was so long. And here I would like to talk about the project I worked, uh, I worked on as curator for the Japan Pavilion at the last year's Biennale, Venice Biennale. So it was a collaboration with many architects, designers, and construction companies, artisans, and so on. So, but my project that I have uh, described provide the basis for the thinking here. And let's start with uh, some back, back, backgrounds. I think it's a shocking picture for you. Uh, heavy machinery is destroying uh, the buildings. But however, such scenes are not rare in Japan. I live in Tokyo and I, when I walk around my neighborhood, I always see several uh, demolition sites like this. So this uh, chart shows the annual amount of uh, industry in the industrial waste generated in Japan by uh, industry type. And this is this pink uh, portion is construction industries. And the construction industry accounts for 20% of the total, uh, producing more than 75 million tons of, of waste annually. So this fact is due to Japan inability to sc stop scrap and build. In particular, houses are often used by only one generation and then thrown away. Only, for example, three, 30 years or 35 years. And the pink broken line in this graph shows the percentage of vacant house in Japan. So vacant house is increasing annually. But the blue bar graph show the number of houses built per year. Um, Japan population has been declining for the past, past 15 years. So the number of vacant houses including uh, very, very rapidly. In spite of this, uh, more than, more than, more than um, 800,000 houses are still being built annually. Uh, from 2008, uh, the, the number of the house construction is slightly increasing. That is a very big problem. It's just this moment. I lose the pointer, sorry. Okay. So uh, Japan is filled with a large amount of uh, housing. And some of these houses are considered to be demolished. It is a very big problem in Japan society. So uh, we decided to think about this problem through our exhibition at the Venice Biennale. And diverse team of architects, designers, researchers, and editors have taken on the challenge of this exhibit. So um, the Venice Biennale is a large scale international exhibition, as you know, and that takes over the whole city of Venice. And the uh, feature of the Venice Biennale, which is a very old uh, exhibition uh, in the world, is that there is an exhibition for uh, each country. So Japan also has its own pavilion and where the exhibition will be held. This is a picture uh, of the exhibition, uh, a former of mine, uh, who it was curated by Momoyo Kajima. Uh, she is Momoyo. Uh, she is now uh, teaching at Eteha. Anyway. Um, the idea 
was to get in a house, as uh, Thibault uh, kindly introduced, to get in a house that was being demolished, dismantled it, and transport it to Venice and reconstruct it in Venice. So this is a house that was about to be in a waste in Japan. So our challenge was to, 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 to restore its value in Venice. And these pictures were taken in Venice by the architects uh, we worked with uh, in this project. His name is uh, Joe Nagasaka. And to Joe Nagasaka, to him, uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, pictures from us. This red and white striped tape looked very cool. Uh, but sometimes things that are common to people in Venice look like something unusual uh, to tourists from far away. So this we thought could be a clue or a hint clue. So moving one house farther, farther away could lead to a revival of the value of the house, like the renewal of the value of things through the tourist eyes. This is the opposite direction, but uh, we thought it is uh, we can make a similar, uh, a similar uh, event in our exhibition. And this uh, very, very lovely house in Tokyo is what we transported to Venice. And you, all, you have already seen this house. Uh, yes, it was the shop house across the street from my house. And it would be a long story to tell you why we were able to bring this house to Venice, but it was just a coincidence. And I think I can say that the demolition of house is such a very familiar problem. And we call uh, this house as Takamizawa House in honor of its owner, uh, Mr. Takamizawa. And it was a raw house row house, two houses, two units, uh, consisting of three houses attached to each other with shops at front, shop at front, which is this portion. And from this, uh, from inside the shop portion, and by the demotion, uh, the, we found layers uh, of wall finishes from different times uh, like this. And this recent uh, wallpaper uh, was actually handmade by Takamizawa family. Can you see? Can you see? This is a, a very different series uh, stickers, and they attached these uh, tiny little patterns on white paper, but one by one. So cute and full of the, their ideas. And this is the interior of the house. It is a very normal, uh, slightly old fashioned house that every Japanese had experienced. And it's a kitchen. And you can see this text and the marking, uh, marking on the wall here. The Takamiza family had a family room recalling uh, children's heart on the wall year by year. It's such a nice memory of the happy family uh, events. And you could find those kind of traces of, the, the, what, of their lives everywhere in this house. And this is the bathroom and this is the entrance. Uh, the floor were finished with pretty vinyl tires, vinyl tires, and the bathtub was a very beautiful sky blue. In upper floor of the old oldest section of this house, and typical uh, partition doors in Japan made of wood and uh, papers, and it was deteriorating. But you could also see that it had been partially repaired by Mr. Takamizawa, like this, and his family with their favorite posture. Uh, and pictures, posters from American countries and posters or pictures uh, that they loved. And I think 
Takamiza family probably loved this house, but I do not think they had any uh, strong ethics, um, aesthetics sense. I think they accept, accepted what they uh, like from among the popular products uh, of that time. And another upper floor, and it was the second oldest section of this house. And this newest section, uh, this is the newest uh, portion of this house in which Mr. Takamizawa had lived up to right before the demolition. Interior of it, uh, interior of it also. It was like it was just like a house in Tokyo, full of things. And here we started the demolition, and like this, and another picture from demolition also. And in the demolition, we cut out many samples here and there, like this. For use for for us to use uh, while design studies uh, cut ceiling and after a while the wooden framework appeared and if we lose the information of the uh, position of the components or elements after demolition we would not be able to assemble them in Venice. So we decided to put uh, stickers with printed ID uh, on energy or on neverly components. So these um, QR codes are all, all different, uh, very unique, uh, every unit. And sticker attached to the pillars and line these, we put stickers on every uh, members, uh, every members. But however, the sticker sometimes did not stay in position well, and the raw sticker got uh, stuck to unexpected places. For instance, here on Mr. Takamiza's back. In this case, we could lose, uh, we would lose information about the components, but rather than being too crazy about the precision of the tagging, we had a lot of discussion to somehow reinterpret the loss of information as a trigger of creative action of design, which I will talk more about later. So here are the wooden structures seen from the, uh, the, the, the store side, shop side, and from the south, uh, wooden structures. In the newest section, also uh, from the south, and the new structure was partially steel steel framed. This, and sometimes uh, some components such as the 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 one of wet construction got broken and lost. Also, portion like mud walls could not be exported anyway. Uh, anyway, for quarantine reasons. And of course, the house could not be demolished all at once with heavy machinery. So the demolition had to be uh, carefully done one by one uh, by hands. And in parallel, surveys by the historians were also conducted. And Takamizawa house was newly built by Mr. Takamizawa's fathers and Mr. Takamizawa uh, grew up here. So fortunately for us, the old photos were in storage. So as a result, we found that Takamizawa house has changed drastically since it was originally built. Um, Takamizawa house was built in 1905, 1954 and was originally a single story house as in the picture. But in 2019, it was two story house. So here is the picture of when the historical service and they are historians. And the wood left uh, these choices 
in addition to all the, uh, the, the wood left traces of old joints. So based on these traces, in addition to the old photographs and interviews uh, with Mr. Takamizawa, historians have uh, revealed the story of this house. I mean, uh, this diagram. So this figure shows the changes in appearance and the floor plans estimated from the study. And initially, single story house, it was, so, it was then divided into uh, uh, two, 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 two residential units. Perhaps because of it was too small uh, to be divided into two units, the southern, uh, this one, this one, Southern uh, units soon had added on number floors, and perhaps it was uh, too small. Same same reason the north part added the second floor. And in 1978, the units on the south, the, the, the 1978, uh, 78, when the city infrastructure such as gas and water. Uh, wastewater system were installed in these areas. And the uh, bathroom here, uh, bathroom were installed in the area. So in, in this house, uh, we saw the blue bus stops. And, and in 1982, uh, Mr. Takamizawa got married and a new house was built within this, area, this site. And the, 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 this is an area around Takamizawa house, uh, also a change drastically. Uh, this black dot represents the location of Takamizawa house, and the gray area uh, represents the populated urban areas. Uh, you can see that initially located uh, in 1960s, uh, located on the edge of the urban areas. But today, the Kamiza house uh, has been swallowed uh, up by the urban areas. So the location was uh, very, very changed. And the Kamiza house itself swallowed histories. A lot of uh, old objects, tools, or sometimes some things were also found in this house. Uh, this is uh, all scissors that were used in a barber shop that opened in 1954 and soon closed down. And this is a door that had been closed when the extension was conducted. And also this is a window. A uh, window had been covered when the extension and found from the inside uh, the wall quite demolition uh, this time. And this is a ceremonial object celebrating the assembly of the structure and uh, thanking gods as a traditional Japanese ceremony. And it had also uh, kept above the ceiling map uh, to them. Uh, this is a, a old signage, uh, hidden signage. And uh, surprising, uh, and surprising enough, a jigsaw puzzle was found from the inside of the wall. And Mr. Takamizawa recalled that the jigsaw puzzles uh, were his hobby when he was young. And the morning show finished uh, vacant areas. And the uh, dismantled elements were taken to the rental, rented uh, warehouse for inspection and organize them for their transportation to Venice. Uh, the warehouse got filled up quickly and the elements which looked lovely when they were in the house started to look like a garbage as soon as they were moved to the warehouse. It was uh, as, if, as if the wildness that the elements had been secretly keeping inside had suddenly, suddenly come up all at once. So I remember that, that we design team 
were very flustered when we saw the warehouse uh, filled with like uh, garbage uh, elements. And at this at times like this, it is uh, it is an important way to try to learn more about them we don't know very well. So as far the major structure components, we did three dimensional scannings, 3D scanning of them by making calm custom jigs. Uh, this is the jigs, uh, new, new made uh, uh, jig. And this jig is covered with tapes, uh, with markers of them. So this is because the computer cannot well recognize an object that has no uh, distinct, distinctive form, such as a pillar. In this case, uh, of, uh, in this case of the of object with a series of the same cross sections, the computer cannot recognize the where it is scanning. So, so these are scanned elements. The top above line is the older beam, and the bottom is a newer beam. And in the past, logs were used as they were for beams because it curved in the next unexpected uh, directions when sawn. If you saw, uh, it will uh, curve in unexpected directions. On the other hand, logs are difficult to handle. So beam of the newer era are machine dried and sawn into standard core sections. But for computers, standardized, standardized elements may this not be easy to handle. This gives us uh, an in implication for building production once mass customization has been achieved. Anyway, uh, after some inspections, we carried them out from the uh, warehouse and one by one carefully. And the next step is finally the custom uh, formalities and packing them into crates like this and loading them into containers. And then uh, they left to Tokyo Bay. And this was February in February 2020. And right after that, the pandemic happened. So Takamiza has had been stuck in the port of Venice for a long time, maybe two or three months. So it was the end of the May uh, 2020 when Takamiza house in Venice started to move in again at last, at least up to the Venice, uh, uh, the Biennale site. So I was very uh, happy when I received this picture uh, from Venice. This is a, a river or a canal in Venice. So carrying the, the, the components in the Giardini, which is a park in Venice, and carrying into the Japanese pavilion. And then they had to be waiting uh, there for the construction works to get started. And the Biennale at our time had to be postponed uh, for, uh, for one year. And after a long delay, the Biennale Foundation suddenly informed us that the opening would be in May 2021. So we rushed to organize the construction team and started uh, installation. But unfortunately, we, uh, the Japanese architecture architect team, uh, were not able to go to Venice. So we had a Zoom live broadcast of the site and watched it every night. So we could see the construction through the screen, but we could not give uh, proper in instructions. So it was very frust frustrating for us. And in May, we could finish the difficult construction work, but even at the opening, we were not able to go to Venice. So unlike, unlike, unlike Momoyo, who is a former uh, curator, 
our opening was done online, which was very sad for me. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna gonna talk about the ex exhibition. Uh, the Japanese pavilion needs um, architecture with uh, pillow pigs in the garden, uh, garden, and which is in a big public park called the Jardin, where other countries' pavilions pavilions are also located next to each other. And in our plans. The interior space here, uh, space of the pavilion is allocated to storage and the pillow pee is uh, to workshop space. And because the only space left was the garden here, a series of work upcycle with Takamiza houses elements were then exhibited in the garden. So garden is the exhibiting areas. The, the, the interior is a storage area and the PLP is a, a workshop. And yeah, this is our uh, plan. So this is the pavilion. Uh, I mean, this is a pavilion, Japan pavilion, Japan in Italy. And the PLP underneath and the garden in front. So here is the approach to the entrance. Here is the approach to the entrance. So let's make a small tour. So firstly, you can find uh, some upcycle work in the garden. Um, this one was this one used to be the Takamizawa Takamiza house uh, roof, and now redesigned into a huge bench and also functioning as the best place to see the uh, green screen here uh, in the back. The position of the Takamiza house in the exhibition were used in a different ways without changing uh, the shape. And uh, this roof will explain the rule of our exhibition to the visitors, I think. So to reconstruct the parts of the houses, of course, some components are lost during the demolition process. So our team decided to enjoy this loss as an opportunity for new creations. So the lost surface of this roof is now replaced uh, by soft materials. So this allows visitors to relax on this roof uh, they are very relaxing. And we equip a small uh, table, support various various activities. And the most surprising one might be the, this one. Uh, the, this visitor made a Japanese tea ceremony here. We found many of such funny photos on Instagram. And you can see the inside structure of the roof. And it had got a photo, photo spot for visitors. And this work is kind of a reconstruction of the shop front of Takamizawa house. Uh, maybe you remember the green facade of the uh, corner. This is the one. And this is a very uh, thin billboard of the shop in Tokyo and then it invited visitors into, into the garden in the Japanese pavilion in Venice. And here as well, the mortal facade uh, was lost and then replaced into the light mesh fabric with green color, which is chosen in uh, anticipation of cheap transportation via uh, hand luggage inside. Uh, facade screen swing with the wind and uh, merge into the new environment. And this is a, a reconstructed wall. This wall used to be to the to the south facade of Takamizawa house. And the, most of the finishes of the wall, including red uh, corrugated sheet, got broken when demolished and lost. So the lost portion uh, had been replaced with transparent materials, transparent materials. So you can also see the red 
mesh materials, which are wet, which are which the prints of the 3D scanned data of the interior of the house right before the demolition. And now let's enter the storage space uh, inside. And the components and photos of the house are exhibited uh, chronologically. So you can find the QR code stickers and like this. And if you can scan them, uh, they show you uh, where each components used to be located in the house. And some of the photos were given by Mr. Takamizawa. And it starts from the construction site just after World War II. And, and they include the memories of the owners. And you can find a lot of unique components. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the, the repaired uh, partitions uh, you saw in the, the construction site, uh, demolition site. And their uniqueness helps you to feel the history of this house and the memories uh, and the emotions of the family at the same time. Yeah, and I think you remember the sky blue bathtub. And one day uh, we received, received a call from the Italian interior designer who had visited our exhibitions. And he really wanted to use this blue bathtub for his new project. But for to, to us Japanese, this is a very old fashioned bathtub. However, the value of that bathtub had changed simply, simply because the context had changed. So our attempt to revive value through transportation has been succeeded. So anyway, now let's move uh, onto the PLT, passing through the backstage, uh, backside of the pavilion. And here is the workshop space. This space is for, is for production. So equipments and furniture for the workshop are provided by using old beams and pillars of the Takamizawa house. So this workshop supports one of, one, one of our, our very important concept. I mean, uh, ever changing exhibition like Takamizawa house were changed ever and ever. So during the exhibition period, period of six months, we keep uh, producing and construction, constructing. So in the co collaboration with Italian artisans, artisans. And finally, uh, last time, we managed to travel these uh, there and did a lot of uh, the construction work. So making uh, T-shaped steel, uh, this has a, a very simple joint system and two uh, wood uh, could connect it uh, using this just very simple joints. And this is also to compose with uh, transparent materials also used for the wall near the uh, entrance. And another stool, uh, this was made by the toilet floor of the vinyl materials. And uh, this is a, a kitchen uh, vinyl materials, kitchen floor uh, with uh, which the pattern was so cute. So this is a plant pot made by another architect. So this valueless, valueless, valueless materials got hot within mass architects. So architects were fighting over the toilet floor. So this is, a, a, I don't know, a something cute, but the visitor enjoyed uh, such, pro, uh, such uh, cute product. So anyway, uh, there are, uh, 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 yeah, these images are found on Instagram. And in fact, we were, uh, yeah, yeah. So now elements from Takamizawa house uh, uh, spreading. Uh, in fact, we were uh, secretly selling these product for the visitors. It's a very secret to the uh, Vienna Foundation. So now 
the elements from Takamizan house are spreading worldwide, physically and digitally via Insta Instagram. So here uh, I have the physical one, uh, uh, this one. So uh, this workshop in PLT was the end of our exhibition. But in fact, the journey of this house did not end in Venice. Uh, after the closing of the Biennale, the house went to Oslo, Norway. So we did not want to leave the house in Venice after the exhibition. Um, this is because throwing away this house after the exhibition would mean uh, taking the waste or garbages all the way to Venice. So this opportunity was created by one of the friendship, I, the one of the friends I made around the world through the Biennale. So in this Biennale, we had the opportunity to have online discussion with curators from different countries uh, during a postponement. One of them, a Norwegian curator at the Philippine Pavilion, uh, whose name is Alexander Eriksson Furness, offered us the chance to transport, transport the house to Oslo. So the house went to the corner of the housing complex in the suburban, and the name of this town is Shretiloka. So Takamizawa house will be uh, added to this building on the slope. Uh, this building, this building, uh, this building originally in a kindergarten, and, but the building is now used as a community space on the lower floor and a supermarket on the upper floor, which uh, is often seen in Norway called uh, Yokea in Norway, Norwegian language. So this is a model photo uh, which uh, my student made. Uh, this equipped the uh, Yokea uh, signboard. Anyway, uh, other side of the model. So Takamiza House will be used as a community gallery in Shirekoka. And originally just a private, privately owned house, but it will become uh, something uh, public by interacting with many people. So this is a public building. So when we think of public buildings, we image large, uh, magnificent building, but it is a big surprise for me, to me, that such a public building is also a possible, such small public buildings also possible. I think this is also the result of the material we use. The reuse of the materials also has the effect of weaving a meaningful story in making it shapes shared with many peoples. So this is the past May, uh, I traveled to Oslo for a workshop with the community using the model. And it was very uh, beautiful experience for me. I mean, here is a very diverse community of people, including uh, immigrants. And the project is also involved many uh, professions, not only residents, but also local architects, uh, artists, and the governments. So this diverse community discussed on an equal ground, what kind of space they want. And our friend Alexander has positioned uh, this trial as an attempt to building with the mutual support um, of the communities. So recently, uh, the motivation from cost construction has become completely market driven but I believe this is an important exper uh, experiment. This is uh, driven uh, by the mot motivation by the, the, the community, um, uh, how does the community, uh, yeah, wants. And uh, uh, here is a photo of the another model, structure model. And you can see some wood, uh, which are darker in color and uh, uh, others are uh, lighter colors. So in fact, the wood from Takamizawa house is not enough for construction. So we will add uh, Norwegian wood and all 
of this, uh, and all of this is old and reused to it. So the lighter color is the, in this model is a Norwegian based wood, and the, the, the use of old wood for structural members is a very new experiment in Norway. And I have heard that it has become possible in Norway since the building code was changed in, in this past July. So we are trying to use reused materials as much as possible for the exterior wall and others. So this is the, uh, the, the Norwegian wood. It was prepared by Omtore, a construction company that uh, deals in used materials. And this is a study of using old wood. It is very exciting. Uh, this is a study of the uh, use of the old wood by engineers from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology who were involved in this project. Since, uh, by them, since the lengths of the wood uh, vary, uh, they used uh, grasshopper to optimize the, 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 the use of the wood. And the amount of the uh, old Norwegian wood uh, that we were able to secure was also limited. So in this model, uh, the red area is where the wood is lacking at this moment. As a result of such study, it is necessary to use members differently from the conventional uh, hierarchy of the structure. I mean, for example, that the diagonals, uh, for example, that diagonals would sometimes be thicker than the pillars. So uh, we, we realized that the old wood is the other outside of or out of our control. So how will uh, we coexist, coexist with the otherness of these elements? <clears throat> so a theory will be necessary, which differs from the conventional aesthetic, uh, uh, aesthetics based on the standards, standardized components. So we aim to complete this project next year, uh, this year, uh, no, no, the next year, 2023. So it's my conclusion. So this diagram represents the life of this house. And the house has experimented uh, uh, a great deal of time and spatial movement. When it was newly built, in, newly built, it was just a house for only one family. But soon the family grew and the house had many additions. And in, uh, to, in, in 2019, the house met the architects who challenged it for the exhibition. Yeah, including me, myself. Can you recognize it is me? Anyway, and this dismantled, and it was assembled by artisans in Venice and met with people from all over the world. And some will be uh, turned into furniture and sp spread all over the world. And some will be some will become the components of the community gallery in Nosto, where they will meet people from diverse backgrounds. So we already, we already know about the long journey that this house went through. So there were many, many meetings with different peoples. So then maybe this house or this, the products from this house is not something that I can own. I mean, it's a kind of a common property uh, that has passed through the hands of many, pe many peoples. So once you awake to this kind of feeling, you will see all buildings as common property of societies. If that happens, we probably won't be able to abandon the building lightly. So uh, in front of the Japan Pavilion, there is a message that said, it is absurd to claim that 
our actions belong solely to ourselves. It means we are living in a network of actions. So that is the message we wanted to share in this exhibition. So uh, it's a so long story, but that's all. Thank you for your kind attentions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kozo, for this um, for this lecture. Um, it's always a little uh, silent uh, when you do it through Zoom, but I will sure the, the the audience would be really really noisy uh, if it was for real. So, thanks again. Um, I was writing in the chat uh, if uh, anyone has a question, uh, maybe you can either uh, take the mic or simply write it down in the chat and we can translate and say it loud or uh, anything. Um, but maybe as, 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 a, as a starting point, um, I'll be very happy to remind the, the marvelous um, uh, subjects you raised uh, today, uh, such as the idea of, of, of the whole, of course, uh, which is something we mentioned as an introduction at the beginning where you kind of make this opposition between elements and, and whole elements as an autonomy uh, as a possible autonomy and the whole as something that is let's say a fragile a moment uh, of an element uh, which can also uh, be part of, the, of another whole uh, later and you make this great reference to Venturi and Scott Brown which of course in one of the chapter uh, they call it the difficult hole. So they already raised the question of the relations between uh, architectural elements and the conceptual whole of a building. Uh, you also talked about this uh, kind of the, the abolition, let's say, of hierarchy uh, between the elements, which at some point, they all uh, belong to a certain architectural uh, inside landscape. And you kind of uh, destroy um, the hierarchy between what holds the building and what do not, and at some point, any object that you manipulate when you build is part of the architecture. And I think that's something very, very important to us. You also talked about uh, the fact that you wish to restore uh, value uh, to the things and to the objects. And I think it is also, uh, to me, a very important and very uh, powerful path to, to, to reach the idea of the economy at some point, risk of value to economical and to very ordinary and simple things. And maybe here is a question, um, because in, 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 my, in, the, in the title of, of, of the series, we talk about the object, okay? Then in your title of, of your lecture, you talk about uh, elements. And at some point during the lecture, you talked about components, and I and I wonder uh, with the three ways of talking and let let's say uh, flying around the same thing, is there a distance that you create between uh, again uh, the autonomy and the and the, and the constraints of the whole at some point? Is there when you become an object at some point you get and you reach the autonomy, and when you are a component or maybe an an element then there is this idea of the whole that's behind uh, you know, our mind. And um, yeah, that would be maybe as a starting point, uh, a semantic uh, precision that is to me very interesting to, to, to have in mind. Thank you. Should I say, should I say something? Uh, yes, or maybe no, I don't know. Um, <laughs> if, you want, if you prefer to listen to everyone uh, as a starting point, I would understand. So there is one question, maybe if you, you don't have to answer, it's just, um, you know, a yeah, remark. So, so, some are asking the designer's name. Who yeah, someone is asking table. the designer of the uh, table, exactly. He, he, his name is Daisuke Motogi, and he is a collaborator of the, uh, our exhibitions, one of the collaborators. He maybe designed the... Yeah, Dice Kamotagi, and he designed the roof bench in our exhibition. Maybe you can write it down to be sure that the spelling sure, sure. Okay. Okay. Would, be, would be great. Sure.
And, I, and waiting for the questions, I'd like to add to uh, something to the Tibo's comment. The um, my uh, the title of the uh, my talk is uh, autonomy, autonomy of the elements means uh, usually um, architects uh, thinks uh, there is a wholeness. Uh, the building is the has the wholeness, but my trial trials is to move the eyes from the building into um, to, to uh, each element. So uh, from the eye of the elements, elements has its uh, own principles differently. And I think it is um, very, um, how to say, it is a very respective uh, something for architects because elements has many, many histories where some elements has includes um, very creative ideas who made, who designed or who constructed the, the, the elements. So elements sometimes uh, teaches to architects about their, uh, their, um, their ideas or histories or something. So um, for me, uh, usually architects um, eliminates the feature, the feature of the elements, and the architect cannot uh, use the potential of the elements. I mean, each elements know the histories or, or its context or its uh, creative ideas. So architects can ask um, to the elements. So I designed my house like making an interview with uh, elements. And I'm talking about uh, the, the, the the project in Biennale, um, it is um, very important. If we move the eye to the elements, the building package, the building as a package is not important. So we the so, so building can can dismantle into the spatial and time. Um, wide areas. So of course, you know, the elements are flying you know, all the all around the world, for example, transporting. And sometimes elements is a furniture, but sometimes in other times, some elements became in a, a house. And elements also flying away all the world. And this expand itself as the um, um is a range that architects should design. So we architects can design very, uh, um, very huge expand of time and space. So this is a discovery through uh, the BNI project. Thank you, Tibor. No, thanks to you. It's true that this, um, this idea of space uh, and time is something um, because to me, it's also a matter of, of energy and, and, how, um, and how much energy you spend to move uh, one element, an element, I mean, from, one, from mm -hmm. one space to another. But it also means uh, how long it takes to move an element from one space to another. And I think it's a really um, interesting way to deal with this, this idea of um, the reuse of the object and the, the, the plant uh, obsolescence of things. And how do you manage at some point? Uh, and it's also, yeah, to manage at some point to, uh, again, to revalue um, the possible uh, second lives mm. of the things uh, you deal with and you manipulate when you build. And at some point, if we all have in mind what you say about your pavilion, uh, when you start uh, dealing with object on a construction site at some point, you mm -hmm. it forces you to me that, the object you manipulate has to have a second life and you mm -hmm. have to then design it and invent it as uh, with its possible autonomy, you know what I mean? And I think this is something that turns around and that, 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 uh, that we uh, invent the act of building to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, talking about the energy consumption, our project is stupid, of course. But um, talking about our project, our approach is not from engineering approach. 
this is, I think, narrative approach. I know in European countries or other countries, the reuse of material is a very hot topic. But almost um, the approaches are uh, in engineering approach. I think it is uh, not enough. We need a narrative approach because um, narrative approach can generate a you know, strong story and the people can share not only materials, but also the story. So we can share the big story, and a small story via a small elements. Um, in spite of, we live a very different context. So a reuse of material um, has a potential to connect the peoples or uh, something in different context. So it is a, a, a possibility, possibility of a narrative approach. Um, okay, I don't, I don't see any um, questions. Maybe I have one also remark, which I uh, really enjoyed. I mean, um, the thing is that you said about the, the fact that in your approach, uh, I mean, specifically in the, in the pavilion uh, project, but in your approach, you've been um, considering through this idea and the consciousness of the object, of the elements, let's say, um, the idea of, I mean, the, the availability to involve um, a very large variety of, uh, of uh, creators. And to me also in the act of doing, the act of uh, le faire, the, 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 the fact that we do things, I think in, in, in the pictures you showed with the workshops uh, beneath um, the pavilion, it is also a way to re-involve uh, the people that do the things uh, in the act of building. And this is also the idea of objects to me, it's always related to ordinariness. And an object is something at some point that you can hand, uh, handle with a hand. And, um, and I like uh, the, 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 the scale uh, that you talk about and the scale of the object that you, that you talk about through the pavilion, because it's to me something which is uh, definitely and an, an deeply human uh, scale, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's also another way to reinvent. I mean, of course, you talk, we only talk about domestic and small scale projects, but still the act of building is obviously and directly related to the size of a hand and that we have two hands and that we cannot do many things with our two hands, but we still can do many things. And, um, and I like this relation of, of the scale of construction to the scale of the object. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. So I don't know, maybe there is no question, but actually all the students, they have classes at 2.30, the, the, so they all have to, to go. So okay. maybe we have to end uh, here again. Kozo, thank you very much on behalf of the school and personally for, uh, for your speech and for this great lecture. Um, and, uh, and I really hope that I will have the, 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 the chance to see you either in Europe or in Japan. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Have a nice afternoon. See Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye.